Dead Souls, Part Two, Chapter One, Section One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dead Souls by Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol, translated by D. J. Hogarth. Part Two, Chapter One, Section One, read by Anno Simon. Why do I so persistently paint the poverty? the imperfections of russian life and delve into the remotest depths the most retired holes and corners of our empire from our subjects the answer is that there is nothing else to be done when an author's idiosyncrasy happens to incline him that way so again we find ourselves in a retired spot but what a spot imagine if you can a mountain range like a gigantic fortress with embrasures and bastions which appear to soar a thousand versts towards the heights of heaven and, towering grandly over a boundless expanse of plain, are broken up into precipitous, overhanging limestone cliffs. Here and there those cliffs are seamed with watercourses and gullies, while at other points they are rounded off into spurs of green, spurs now coated with fleece-like tufts of young undergrowth, now studded with the stumps of felled trees, now covered with timber which has, by some miracle, escaped the woodman's axe. Also, a river winds a while between its banks, then leaves the meadowland, divides into runlets, all flashing in the sun like fire, plunges, reunited, into the midst of a thicket of elder, birth, and pine, and lastly speeds triumphantly past bridges and mills and wares which seem to be lying in wait for it at every turn. At one particular spot, the steep flank of the mountain range is covered with billowy verdure of denser growth than the rest and here the aid of skilful planting added to the shelter afforded by a rugged ravine has enabled the flora of north and south so to be brought together that twined about with sinuous hop tendrils the oak the spruce fir the wild pear the maple the cherry the thorn and the mountain ash either assist or check one another's growth and everywhere cover the declivity with their straggling profusion also, at the edge of the summit, there can be seen mingling with the green of the trees the red roofs of a manorial homestead, while behind the upper story is the mansion proper and its carved balcony and a great semicircular window, there gleam the tiles and gables of some peasants' huts. Lastly, over this combination of trees and roofs, there rises, overtopping everything with its gilded, sparkling steeple, an old village church. On each of its pinnacles a cross of carved gilt is stayed with supports of similar gilding and design, with the result that from a distance the gilded portions have the effect of hanging without visible agency in the air, and the whole, the three successive tiers of woodland, roofs, and crosses whole, lies exquisitely mirrored in the river below, where hollow willows, grotesquely shaped, some of them rooted on the river's banks, and some in the water itself, and all drooping their branches until their leaves have formed a tangle with the water-lilies which float on the surface, seem to be gazing at the marvellous reflection at their feet. Thus the view from below is beautiful indeed, but the view from above is even better. No guest, no visitor, could stand on the balcony of the mansion and remain indifferent. So boundless is the panorama revealed that surprise would cause him to catch at his breath, and exclaim, "'Lord of heaven! But what a prospect!' Beyond meadows studded with spinneys and watermills lie forests belted with green, while beyond, again, there can be seen showing through the slightly misty air strips of yellow heath, and again wide rolling forests, as blue as the sea or a cloud, and more heath, paler than the first, but still yellow. Finally, on the far horizon, a range of chalk-topped hills gleams white, even in dull weather, as though it were lightened with perpetual sunshine and here and there on the dazzling whiteness of its lower slopes some plaster-like nebulous patches represent far-off villages which lie too remote for the eye to discern their details indeed only when the sunlight touches a steeple to gold does one realize that each such patch is a human settlement finally all is wrapped in an immensity of silence which even the far faint echoes of persons singing in the void of the plain cannot shatter even after gazing at the spectacle for a couple of hours or so, the visitor would still find nothing to say save, Lord of heaven, but what a prospect! Then, who is the dweller in, the proprietor of this manor, a manor to which, as to an impregnable fortress, 
entrance cannot be gained from the side where we have been standing, but only from the other approach, where a few scattered oaks offer hospitable welcome to the visitor, and then, spreading above him their spacious branches, as in friendly embrace, accompany him to the façade of the mansion whose top we have been regarding from the reverse aspect, but which now stands frontwise on to us, and has, on one side of it, a row of peasants' huts with red tiles and carved gables, and, on the other, the village church, with those glittering golden crosses and gilded open-work charms which seem to hang suspended in the air. Yes, indeed, to what fortunate individual does this corner of the world belong? It belongs to Andrei Ivanovich Tientietnikov, landowner of the canton of Tremalakan, and, withal, a bachelor of about thirty. Should my lady readers ask of me what manner of man is Tientietnikov, and what are his attributes and peculiarities, I should refer them to his neighbours. Of these, a member of the almost extinct tribe of intelligent staff officers on the retired list once summed up Tientietnikov in the phrase, "'He is an absolute blockhead,' while a general who resided ten versts away was heard to remark that, "'He is a young man who, though not exactly a fool, has at least too much crowded into his head.' I myself might have been of use to him, for not only do I maintain certain connections with St. Petersburg, but also— And the general left his sentence unfinished. Thirdly, a captain superintendent of rural police happened to remark in the course of conversation, "'Tomorrow I must go and see Tientietnikov about his arrears.' Lastly, a peasant of Tientietnikov's own village, when asked what his baron was like, returned no answer at all. All of which would appear to show that Tientietnikov was not exactly looked upon with favour. To speak dispassionately, however, he was not a bad sort of fellow, merely a stargazer, and since the world contains many watchers of the skies, why should Tientietnikov not have been one of them? However, let me describe in detail a specimen day of his existence, one that will closely resemble the rest, and then the reader will be enabled to judge of Tientietnikov's character and how far his life corresponded to the beauties of nature with which he lived surrounded. On the morning of the specimen day in question, he awoke very late, and, raising himself to a sitting posture, rubbed his eyes. And since those eyes were small, the process of rubbing them occupied a very long time, and throughout its continuance there stood waiting by the door his valet, Mikhailo, armed with a towel and basin. For one hour, for two hours, did poor Mikhailo stand there, then he departed to the kitchen, and returned to find his master still rubbing his eyes as he sat on the bed. At length, however, Tientietnikov rose, washed himself, donned a dressing-gown, and moved into the drawing-room for morning tea, coffee, coca, and warm milk, of all of which he partook but sparingly, while munching a piece of bread, and scattering tobacco-ash with complete insouciance. Two hours did he sit over this meal, then poured himself out another cup of the rapidly cooling tea, and walked to the window. This faced the courtyard, and, outside it, as usual, there took place the following daily altercation between a serf named Grigory, who purported to act as butler, and the housekeeper, Perfilievna. Grigory? Ah, you nuisance, you good for nothing, you had better hold your stupid tongue. Perfilievna? Yes, and don't you wish that I would? Grigory? What? You so thick with a bailiff of yours, you housekeeping jade? Perfilievna? Nay, he's as big a thief as you are. Do you think the baron doesn't know you? And there he is. He must have heard everything. Grigory? Where? Perfilievna? There, sitting by the window and looking at us. Next, to complete the hubbub, a serf child which had been clouded by its mother broke out into a ball, while a borzoi puppy which had happened to get splashed with boiling water by the cook fell to yelping vociferously. In short, the place soon became a babel of shouts and squeals, and, after watching and listening for a time, the baron found it so impossible to concentrate his mind upon anything that he sent out word that the noise would have to be abated. The next item was that, a couple of hours before luncheon time, he withdrew to his study to set about employing himself upon a weighty work which was to consider Russia from every point of view, from the political, from the philosophical, and from the religious, as well as to resolve various problems which had arisen to confront the empire, and to define clearly the great future to which the country stood ordained. In short, it was to be the species of compilation in which the man of the day so much delights. 
yet the colossal undertaking had progressed but little beyond the sphere of projection, since, after a pen had been gnawed a while, and a few strokes had been committed to paper, the whole would be laid aside in favour of the reading of some book, and that reading would continue also during luncheon, and be followed by the lighting of a pipe, the playing of a solitary game of chess, and the doing of more or less nothing for the rest of the day. The foregoing will give the reader a pretty clear idea of the manner in which it was possible for this man of thirty-three to waste his time. Clad constantly in slippers and a dressing-gown, Tientietnikov never went out, never indulged in any form of dissipation, and never walked upstairs. Nothing did he care for fresh air, and would bestow not a passing glance upon all those beauties of the countryside which moved visitors to such ecstatic admiration. From this the reader will see that Andrei Ivanovitch Tientietnikov belonged to that band of sluggards whom we always have with us, and who, whatever be their present appellation, used to be known by the nicknames of lollopers, bed-pressers, and marmots. Whether the type is a type originating at birth, or a type resulting from untoward circumstances in later life, it is impossible to say. A better course than to attempt to answer that question would be to recount the story of Tientietnikov's boyhood and upbringing. Everything connected with the latter seemed to promise success. For twelve years of age the boy, keen-witted but dream of temperament, and inclined to delicacy, was sent to an educational establishment presided over by an exceptional type of master. The idol of his pupils, and the admiration of his assistants, Alexander Petrovitch, was gifted with an extraordinary measure of good sense. How thoroughly he knew the peculiarities of the Russian of his day! How well he understood boys! How capable he was of drawing them out! Not a practical joker in the school, but, after perpetrating a prank, would voluntarily approach his preceptor and make to him free confession. True, the preceptor would put a stern face upon the matter, yet the culprit would depart with head held higher, not lower than before, since, in Alexander Petrovitch, there was something which hastened, something which seemed to say to a delinquent, Forward you, rise to your feet again, even though you have fallen. Not lectures on good behaviour was it, therefore, that fell from his lips, but rather the injunction, I want to see intelligence and nothing else. The boy who devotes his attention to becoming clever will never play the fool, for under such circumstances folly disappears of itself. And so folly did, for the boy who failed to strive in the desired direction incurred the contempt of all his comrades, and even dunces and fools of senior standing did not dare to raise a finger when saluted by their juniors with opprobrious epithets. Yet, this is too much, certain folk would say to Alexander. The result will be that your students will turn out prigs. But no, he would reply, not at all. You see, I make it my principle to keep the incapables for a single term only, since that is enough for them. But to the clever ones I allot a double course of instruction. And, true enough, any lad of brains was retained for this finishing course. Yet he did not repress all boyish playfulness, since he declared it to be as necessary as a rash to a doctor, inasmuch as it enabled him to diagnose what lay hidden within. Consequently, how the boys loved him! Never was there such an attachment between master and pupils. And even later, during the foolish years, when foolish things attract, the measure of affection which Alexander Petrovitch retained was extraordinary. In fact, to the day of his death, Every former pupil would celebrate the birthday of his late master by raising his glass in gratitude to the mentor dead and buried, then close his eyelids upon the tears which would come trickling through them. Even the slightest word of encouragement from Alexander Petrovitch could throw a lad into a transport of tremulous joy, and arouse in him an honourable emulation of his fellows. Boys of small capacity he did not long retain in his establishment whereas those who possessed exceptional talent he put through an extra course of schooling. This senior class, a class composed of specially selected pupils, was a very different affair from what usually obtains in other colleges. Only when a boy had attained its ranks did Alexander demand of him what other masters indiscreetly require of mere infants, namely the superior frame of mind which, while never indulging in mockery, can itself bear ridicule, and disregard the fool, and keep its temper and repress itself, and eschew revenge, and calmly, proudly retain its tranquillity of soul. In short, whatever avails to form a boy into a man of assured character, that did Alexander Petrovitch employ during the pupil's youth, as well as constantly put him to the test. How well he understood the art of life! 
Of assistant tutors he kept but few, since most of the necessary instruction he imparted in person, and, without pedantic terminology and inflated diction and views, could so transmit to his listeners the inmost spirit of a lesson that even the youngest present absorbed its essential elements. Also, of studies he selected none but those which may help a boy to become a good citizen, and therefore most of the lectures which he delivered consisted of discourses on what may be awaiting a youth as well as of such demarcations of life's field that the pupil, though seated as yet only at the desk, could beforehand bear his part in that field both in thought and spirit. Nor did the master conceal anything. That is to say, without mincing words, he invariably set before his hearers the sorrows and the difficulties which may confront a man, and the trials and the temptations which may beset him. And this he did in terms as though, in every possible calling and capacity, he himself had experienced the same. Consequently, either the vigorous development of self-respect or the constant stimulus of the master's eye, which seemed to say to the pupil, forward, that word which has become so familiar to the contemporary Russian, that word which has worked such wonders upon his sensitive temperament. One or the other, I repeat, would, from the first, cause the pupil to tackle difficulties, and only difficulties, and to hunger for prowess only where the path was arduous, and obstacles were many and it was necessary to display the utmost strength of mind. Indeed, few completed the cause of which I have spoken, without issuing therefrom reliable seasoned fighters who could keep their heads in the most embarrassing of official positions, and at times when older and wiser men, distracted with the annoyances of life, had either abandoned everything or, grown slack and indifferent, had surrendered to the bribe-takers and the rascals. In short, no ex-pupil of Alexander Petrovitch ever wavered from the right road, but, familiar with life and with men, armed with the weapons of prudence, exerted a powerful influence upon wrongdoers. For a long time past, the ardent young Tchentchetnikov's excitable heart had also beat at the thought that one day he might attain the senior class described. And, indeed, what better teacher could he have had before him than its preceptor? Yet just at the moment when he had been transferred thereto, just at the moment when he had reached the coveted position, did his instructor come suddenly by his death. This was indeed a blow for the boy, indeed a terrible initial loss. In his eyes everything connected with the school seemed to undergo a change, the chief reason being the fact that to the place of the deceased headmaster there succeeded a certain Theodor Ivanovitch who at once began to insist upon certain external rules, and to demand of the boys what ought rightly to have been demanded only of adults. That is to say, since the lad's frank and open demeanour savoured to him only of lack of discipline, he announced, as though in deliberate spite of his predecessor, that he cared nothing for progress and intellect, but that heed was to be paid only to good behaviour. Yet, curiously enough, good behaviour was just what he had never obtained, for every kind of secret prank became the rule, and while by day there reigned restraint and conspiracy, by night there began to take place chambering and wantonness. Also, certain changes in the curriculum of studies came about, for there were engaged new teachers who held new views and opinions, and confused their hearers with a multitude of new terms and phrases, and displayed in their exposition of things both logical sequence and a zest for modern discovery, and much warmth of individual bias. Yet their instruction, alas, contained no life. In the mouth of those teachers a dead language savoured merely of carrion. Thus everything connected with the school underwent a radical alteration, and respect for authority, and the authorities, waned, and tutors and ushers came to be dubbed old thedder, crusty, and the like. And sundry other things began to take place, things which necessitated many a penalty and expulsion, until, within a couple of years, no one who had known the school in former days would now have recognized it. Nevertheless, Tchentyatnikov, a youth of retiring disposition, experienced no leanings towards the nocturnal orgies of his companions, orgies during which the latter used to flirt with damsels before the very windows of the headmaster's rooms, nor yet towards their mockery of all that was sacred, simply because fate had cast in their way an injudicious priest. No, despite its dreaminess, its celestial origin, and could not be diverted from the path of virtue. Yet still he hung his head, for, while his ambition had come to life, it could find no sort of outlet. Truly it were well if it had not come to life, for throughout the time 
that he was listening to professors who gesticulated on their chairs, he could not help remembering the old preceptor, who, invariably cool and calm, had yet known how to make himself understood. To what subjects, to what lectures, did the boy not have to listen? To lectures on medicine, and on philosophy, and on law, and on a version of general history so enlarged that even three years failed to enable the professor to do more than finish the introduction thereto, and also the account of the development of some self-governing towns in Germany. None of the stuff remained fixed in Tientietnikov's brain, save as shapeless clots, for though his native intellect could not tell him how instruction ought to be imparted, it at least told him that this was not the way. And frequently, at such moments, he would recall Alexander Petrovitch, and give way to such grief that scarcely did he know what he was doing. But youth is fortunate in the fact that always before it there lies a future, and in proportion as the time for his leaving school drew nigh, Tchentchetnikov's heart began to beat higher and higher, and he said to himself, this is not life, but only a preparation for life. True life is to be found in the public service. There, at least, will there be scope for activity. So, bestowing not a glance upon that beautiful corner of the world which never failed to strike the guest or chance visitor with amazement, and reverencing not a whit the dust of his ancestors, he followed the example of most ambitious men of his class by repairing to St. Petersburg, whither, as we know, the more spirited youth of Russia from every quarter gravitates, there to enter the public service, to shine, to obtain promotion, and, in a word, to scale the topmost peaks of that pale, cold, deceptive elevation which is known as society. But the real starting point of Tchetchetnikov's ambition was the moment when his uncle, one state councillor, Onifri Ivanovitch, instilled into him the maxim that the only means to success in the service lay in good handwriting, and that, without that accomplishment, no one could ever hope to become a minister or statesman. Thus, with great difficulty, and also with the help of his uncle's influence, young Tchentetnikov at length succeeded in being posted to a department. On the day that he was conducted into a splendid, shining hall, a hall fitted with inlaid floors and lacquered desks as fine as though this were actually the place where the great ones of the empire met for discussion of the fortunes of the state, on the day that he saw legions of handsome gentlemen of the quill-driving profession making loud scratchings with pens and cocking their heads to one side, lastly, on the day that he saw himself also allotted a desk and requested to copy a document which appeared purposely to be one of the pettiest possible order, as a matter of fact, it related to a sum of three roubles, and had taken half a year to produce. Well, at that moment, a curious, an unwanted sensation seized upon the inexperienced youth, for the gentlemen around him appeared so exactly like a lot of college students. And, the further to complete the resemblance, some of them were engaged in reading trashy translated novels, which they kept hurriedly thrusting between the sheets of their apportioned work whenever the director appeared as though to convey the impression that it was to that work alone that they were applying themselves. In short, the scene seemed to Tchentchetnikov strange, and his former pursuits more important than his present, and his preparation for the service preferable to the service itself. Yes, suddenly he felt a longing for his old school, and as suddenly, and with all the vividness of life, there appeared before his vision the figure of Alexander Petrovitch he almost burst into tears as he beheld his old master, and the room seemed to swim before his eyes, and the chinovniks and the desks to become a blur, and his sight to grow dim. Then he thought to himself with an effort, No, no, I will apply myself to my work, however petty it be at first. And hardening his heart and recovering his spirit, he determined then and there to perform his duties in such a manner as should be an example to the rest but where are compensations to be found? Even in St. Petersburg, despite its grim and murky exterior, they exist. Yes, even though thirty degrees of keen cracking frost may have bound the streets, and the family of the north wind be wailing there, and the snowstorm which have heaped high the pavements, and be blinding the eyes, and powdering beards and fur collars and the shaggy manes of horses, even then there will be shining hospitably through the swirling snowflakes a fourth-floor window where, in a cosy room, and by the light of modest candles, and to the hiss of the samovar, there will be in progress a discussion which warms the heart and soul, 
or else a reading aloud of a brilliant page of one of those inspired Russian poets with whom God has dowered us, while the breast of each member of the company is heaving with a rapture unknown under a noontide sky. Gradually, therefore, Tchentyatnikov grew more at home in the service. Yet never did it become, for him, the main pursuit, the main object in life, which he had expected. No, it remained but one of a secondary kind. That is to say, it served merely to divide up his time, and enable him the more to value his hours of leisure. Nevertheless, just when his uncle was beginning to flatter himself that his nephew was destined to succeed in the profession, the said nephew elected to ruin his every hope. Thus it befell. Tchentyatnikov's friends, he had many, included among their number a couple of fellows of the species known as ambitious. That is to say, though good-natured souls of that curiously restless type which cannot endure injustice, nor anything which it conceives to be such, they were thoroughly unbalanced of conduct themselves, and, while demanding general agreement with their views, treated those of others with the scantiest of ceremony. Nevertheless, these two associates exercised upon Tchetjetnikov, both by the fire of their eloquence and by the form of their noble dissatisfaction with society, a very strong influence, with the result that, through arousing in him an innate tendency to nervous resentment, they led him also to notice trifles which before had escaped his attention. An instance of this is seen in the fact that he conceived against Theodor Theodorovich Lienitsin, director of one of the departments which was quartered in the splendid range of offices before mentioned, a dislike which proved the cause of his discerning in the man a host of hitherto unmarked imperfections. Above all things, did Tchentchetnikov take it into his head that, when conversing with his superiors, Leonitsin became, of the moment, a stick of luscious sweetmeat, but that, when conversing with his inferiors, he approximated more to a vinegar cruet. Certain it is that, like all petty-minded individuals, Leonitsin made a note of any one who failed to offer him a greeting on festival days, and that he revenged himself upon any one whose visiting card had not been handed to his butler. Eventually the youth's aversion almost attained the point of hysteria, until he felt that, come what might, he must insult the fellow in some fashion. To that task he applied himself con amore, and so thoroughly that he met with complete success. That is to say, he seized on an occasion to address Lienitsin in such fashion that the delinquent received notice either to apologies or to leave the service, and when of these alternatives he chose the latter, his uncle came to him and made a terrified appeal. "'For God's sake, remember what you are doing,' he cried. "'To think that, after beginning your career so well, you should abandon it merely for the reason that you have not fallen in with the sort of director whom you prefer. What do you mean by it? What do you mean by it? Were others to regard things in the same way, the service would find itself without a single individual. Reconsider your conduct, forego your pride and conceit, and make Leonitsin amends.' "'But, dear uncle,' the nephew replied, "'that is not the point. The point is, not that I should find an apology difficult to offer, seeing that, since Leonitsin is my superior, and I ought not to have addressed him as I did, I am clearly in the wrong. Rather, the point is the following. To my charge there has been committed the performance of another kind of service. That is to say, I am the owner of three hundred peasant souls, a badly administered estate, and the fool of a bailiff, that being so, whereas the state will lose little by having to fill my stool with another copyist, it will lose very much by causing three hundred peasant souls to fail in the payment of their taxes. As I say, how am I to put it? I am a landowner who has preferred to enter the public service. Now, should I employ myself henceforth in conserving, restoring, and improving the fortunes of the souls whom God has entrusted to my care, and thereby provide the state with three hundred law-abiding, sober, hard-working taxpayers, how will that service of mine rank as inferior to the service of a department-directing fool like Leonitsin? On hearing this speech, the state councillor could only gape, for he had not expected Tchentyatnikov's torrent of words. He reflected a few moments, and then murmured, "'Yes, but—but—but but, but how can a man like you retire to rustication in the country? What society will you get there?' Here one meets at least a general or a prince sometimes. Indeed, no matter whom you pass in the street, that person represents gas lamps and European civilization. But in the country, no matter what part of it you are in, not a soul is to be encountered save mushiks and their women. 
Why should you go and condemn yourself to a state of vegetation like that? Nevertheless, the uncle's expostulations fell upon deaf ears, for already the nephew was beginning to think of his estate as a retreat of a type more likely to nourish the intellectual faculties and afford the only profitable field of activity. After unearthing one or two modern works on agriculture, therefore, he, two weeks later, found himself in the neighbourhood of the home where his boyhood had been spent, and approaching the spot which never failed to enthrall the visitor or guest and in the young man's breast there was beginning to palpitate a new feeling. In the young man's soul there were reawakening old, long-concealed impressions, with the result that many a spot which had long been faded from his memory now filled him with interest, and the beautiful views on the estate found him gazing at them like a newcomer, and with a beating heart. Yes, as the road wound through a narrow ravine and became engulfed in a forest where, both above and below, he saw three centuries-old oaks, which three men could not have spanned, and where Siberian firs and elms overtopped even the poplars, and as he asked the peasants to tell him to whom the forest belonged, and they replied, to Tchentchetnikov, and he issued from the forest, and proceeded on his way through meadows, and past spinnies of elder, and of old and young willows, and arrived in sight of the distant range of hills, and, crossing by two different ridges the winding river, which he left successively to right and to left of him as he did so. He again questioned some peasants concerning the ownership of the meadows and the flooded lands, and was again informed that they all belonged to Tchentchetnikov, and then, ascending a rise, reached a tableland where, on one side, lay ungarnered fields of wheat and rye and barley, and on the other the country already traversed, but which now showed in shortened perspective and then plunged into the shade of some forked, umbrageous trees which stood scattered over the turf and extended to the manor-house itself, and caught glimpses of the carved huts of the peasants, and of the red roofs of the stone manorial outbuildings, and of the glittering pinnacles of the church, and felt his heart beating, and knew, without being told by any one, whither he had at length arrived. Well, then the feeling which had been growing within his soul burst forth, and he cried in ecstasy, why have I been a fool so long? Why, seeing that fate has appointed me to be ruler of an earthly paradise, did I prefer to bind myself in servitude as a scribe of lifeless documents? To think that, after I had been nurtured and schooled and stored with all the knowledge necessary for the diffusion of good among those under me, and for the improvement of my domain, and for the fulfilment of the manifold duties of a landowner who is at once judge, administrator, and constable of his people, I should have entrusted my estate to an ignorant bailiff, and sought to maintain an absentee guardianship over the affairs of serfs whom I have never met, and of whose capabilities and characters I am yet ignorant. To think that I should have deemed true estate management inferior to a documentary, fantastical management of provinces which lie a thousand versts away, and which my foot has never trod, and where I could never have effected aught but blunders and irregularities— Meanwhile, another spectacle was being prepared for him. On learning that the baron was approaching the mansion, the mushiks collected on the veranda in every variety of picturesque dress and tonsure, and when these good folk surrounded him, and there arose a resounding shout of, "'Here is our foster-father! He has remembered us!' And, in spite of themselves, some of the older men and women began weeping as they recalled his grandfather and great-grandfather. He himself could not restrain his tears, but reflected— how much affection! And in return for what? In return for my never having come to see them, in return for my never having taken the least interest in their affairs. And then and there he registered a mental vow to share their every task and occupation. So he applied himself to supervising and administering. He reduced the amount of the bashchina, he decreased the number of working days for the owner, and he augmented the sum of the peasant's leisure time. Footnote. Baschina. In the days of serfdom, the rate of forced labour, so many hours or so many days per week, which the serf had to perform for his proprietor. And footnote. He also dismissed the fool of a bailiff, and took to bearing a personal hand in everything, to being present in the fields, at the threshing floor, at the kilns, at the wharf, at the freighting of barges and rafts, and at their conveyance down the river. Wherefore even the lazy hands began to look to themselves but this did not last long. The peasant is an observant individual, 
and Jenjetnikov's musics soon scented the fact that, though energetic and desirous of doing much, the baron had no notion how to do it, nor even how to set about it, that, in short, he spoke by the book rather than out of his personal knowledge. Consequently, things resulted not in master and men failing to understand one another, but in their not singing together, in their not producing the very same note. That is to say, it was not long before Tientietnikov noticed that on the manorial lands nothing prospered to the extent that it did on the peasants. The manorial crops were sown in good time, and came up well, and every one appeared to work his best, so much so that Tientietnikov, who supervised the whole, frequently ordered mugs of vodka to be served out as a reward for the excellence of the labour performed. Yet the rye on the peasant's land had formed into ear, and the oats had begun to shoot their grain, and the millet had filled, before, on the manorial lands, the corn had so much as grown to stalk, or the ears had sprouted in embryo. In short, gradually the baron realised that, in spite of favours conferred, the peasants were playing the rogue with him. Next he resorted to remonstrance, but was met with the reply, "'How could we not do our best for our baron? You yourself saw how well we laboured at the ploughing and the sowing, for you gave us mugs of vodka for our pains.' "'Then why have things turned out so badly?' the baron persisted. "'Who can say? It must be that a grub has eaten the crop from below. Besides, what a summer has it been! Never a drop of rain!' Nevertheless, the baron noted that no grub had eaten the peasant's crops, as well as that the rain had fallen in the most curious fashion, namely, in patches. It had obliged the moujiks, but had shed a mere sprinkling for the baron. Still more difficult did he find it to deal with the peasant women. Ever and anon they would beg to be excused from work, or start making complaints of the severity of the barstchina. Indeed, they were terrible folk. However, Tchentchetnikov abolished the majority of the tithes of linen, hedge-fruit, mushrooms, and nuts, and also reduced by one-half other tasks proper to the women, in the hope that they would devote their spare time to their own domestic concerns, namely to sewing and mending, and to making clothes for their husbands, and to increasing the area of their kitchen gardens. Yet no such result came about. On the contrary, such a pitch did the idleness, the quarrelsomeness, and the intriguing and cabaling of the fair sex attain that their helpmeets were for ever coming to the baron with a request that he would rid one or another of his wife, since she had become a nuisance, and to live with her was impossible. Next, hardening his heart, the baron attempted severity. But of what avail was severity? The peasant woman remained always the peasant woman and would come and whine that she was sick and ailing, and keep pitifully hugging to herself the mean and filthy rags which she had done for the occasion. And when poor Tchentchetnikov found himself unable to say more to her than just, "'Get out of my sight, and may the Lord go with you!' The next item in the comedy would be that he would see her, even as she was leaving his gates, fall to contending with a neighbour for, say, the possession of a turnip, and dealing out slaps in the face such as even a strong, healthy man could scarcely have compassed. End of part two, chapter one, section one.